little bit of a liar here because I said I was going to take a break after my last Castlevania review. That didn't happen. Over the last weekend, I spent pretty much the entire time playing through the final of the three Game Boy Advance titles on the Castlevania collection. This one entitled the Aria of Sorrow. It released on May 6th, 2003, and it was the last of the three uh, Game Boy Advance games, the other ones being uh, Harmony of Dissonance and Circle of the Moon. I have video reviews for those in the description below and on my video review playlist. So if you wanna see my thoughts as they have expanded over the years playing through these Castlevania games, uh, please do check those out. This is without a doubt the best of the three for a lot of reasons. And from what I have read online, I have the Wikipedia article open here and I was reading through some of the Metacritic reviews earlier. By far, it is the highest rated of the three. It's very clear that the team had learned a lot of mistakes over the years and really just wanted to focus on making the best Castlevania experience they could and I think they nailed it, despite the fact that it is wildly different than the other two in a good way. Um, I had a lot, a lot of fun playing with it. So this game takes place with a brand new protagonist, Soma Cruz. Soma has no tie-ins to the Belmont family. As a matter of fact, the game starts in 2035 during a solar eclipse in Japan of all places where Soma and his, I don't know if it's his girlfriend or some female that's close to him, decide to go look at the eclipse and they are transported into Dracula's castle. It seems that inside of the eclipse in this place that is neither here nor there, this like alternate reality of sorts, um, Dracula's castle and the embodiment of Dracula is alive and well. A lot of other people were sucked up into this event as well. You'll meet quite a few characters, including a merchant, um, some other people who say they have ties into this. You're gonna meet a guy that's got amnesia. You're gonna meet some interesting characters as time goes on. Not all of them make it, which I thought was interesting for an advanced game. As with the other two, we get a slight amount of swearing um, which I always think is so great in a video game. And it also included some pretty basic themes in terms of like what was happening. Uh, there, don't imagine, you know, a lot of people had the appetite for that, especially in a mobile game. But it does get you in the action pretty quickly, thankfully. Um, and there's a little bit of story there to sink your teeth into if you want to, but it's largely optional, just like the other two games. Uh, lastly, I'll mention there are uh, two different endings. Uh, depending on um, what you did leading up to that. I got the bad ending without knowing. And it not only was it bad in terms of like, it wasn't good. <laughs> it was bad in terms of like what happened to the characters. And it was also bad writing. <laughs> it was like three sentences long. It's like, all right, see you later. Okay, by the end. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> so uh, definitely um, worth playing through to get the good ending. At least you feel a little bit more you know, I guess a little, you feel a little bit more pleasure in the sense that like, oh, okay. It doesn't just abruptly end. There's actually somewhat of a resolution to the story. Um, I'll also mention here very briefly that after you beat the game, there is a boss rush mode and there is a bonus mode in which you play as Julius Belmont, the great grandson of, well, great, 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 great. I don't know what, how many, in 2035, right? I don't know when this takes place like in the castle or how this guy gets here, but you're a Belmont and you have a totally different set of moves and it's a totally different game, which is cool as heck. I did dabble with that a bit too. So why is this game so different than the other Castlevania games? Well, it focuses around this thing they call the tactical soul system. Um, much like Gao in Final Fantasy III, who could go off into the Veld and learn um, of other enemy types, Soma basically will absorb enemies, and that's actually his main power, is after killing certain enemies, you will absorb their powers and take them as your own. See, unlike other classic Castlevania games where you had like the holy fire and, you know, or the holy water that you could throw or the cross boomerang or the ax or the dagger, all that's gone. 
Instead, it's pure magic. The magic you find, though, comes in three different types of magic, um, which they call bullet guardian and enchant magic. All of those magics uh, are your primary offense. You also have a weapon, too. And I'll talk about the weapons in a moment. But the tactical soul system was so neat because you don't have the traditional weapon. So when you used to find hearts in Castlevania, that was kind of like your ammo count. So the more hearts you had by hitting all the candles or by killing enemies or things like that, they would give you the ability to use your weapons more often. You could throw more axes or water or whatever. Here it just buffs up your mana a little bit, which does regenerate on its own over time, but this will obviously allow it to regenerate faster. So if you see an enemy that's like a skeleton that's sh uh, throw uh, shooting a bow and arrow at you, after you kill them, it's random when it'll occur, but it's usually pretty fast. I never felt like it was too grindy at all. Uh, you may have to like reload the room once or twice to get it to trigger. You'll absorb their ability and you add it to a list of all your magical abilities. So on top of your regular attack, you can now summon a bow and arrow that shoots like the skeleton did or an enemy that throws mud like the mud enemies or fire arrows or, or fire attacks. There's so many different attacks. Um, each of them have these, and they, they're broken down, like I said, into these three systems, bully, bullet, guardian, and enchant. You can not only summon things to help you, you can have a constant summon that is like uh, one of the cooler ones I found was Grim Reaper, where it's constantly throwing uh, scythes all around the map. It's slowly draining your magic and just you're constantly just hitting everything around you. Or you can actually summon and basically turn into something else or some major ability, like the ability to um, walk on water or the ability to uh, have like a glider on your back to slow down your jumps or to stop time or to turn into a bat amongst other things. It really enhanced the gameplay because there were so many different ways to play in combat. And depending on what worked, I found that certain enemies had natural weaknesses to certain abilities versus others. And as I talked about in my other two reviews, you really have this great level of customization. It's still this RPG light system. So you can equip different pieces of gear and you can equip um, different weapons that kind of adjust your stats if you want to be more of like a long range or a close range. What do you want to sacrifice in order to get your perfect build? And magic was always kind of like something you could spec into or not. This game really, really emphasizes the magic element. Maybe because people didn't play with it so much in the first two. I don't know. But... Ultimately, you're going to have so many abilities. It's, it's really cool. Maybe overwhelming at the end because you're just going to have pages and pages and pages to sift through. There's no real way to sort or rank them. Unfortunately, um, obviously, this was an older game. They didn't think of those things back then. But being able to select a magic spell and to use it and to see it's very effective against certain types of enemies was very, very rewarding. Um, and as a result of that, it really enhances your combat. Since this game, I felt, had the biggest weapon set, including a handgun, which was awesome. <laughs> uh, the ability to throw magical grenades. Uh, you had weapons that attacked vertically. You had weapons that attacked diagonally. You had weapons that attacked horizontally. That was a lot of fun. You could kind of mix and match your combat there. Um, and some of the weapons I felt were almost of legendary status. They had distinct names and descriptions and very specific abilities, like to turn an enemy into stone or to be ice imbued, which was really, really fun. Uh, no set items, though, unfortunately. It would have been really cool if they had a, like, a whole set that did something cool. But you're going to find lots and lots of items in this game. There is so much customization of how you can play, much more so than the other two. It made it a lot of fun. And there were so many places where there were hidden areas to find really cool pieces of gear or specifically designed challenge rooms, which were very clearly off the main path, which required you to fight gauntlets of enemies in order to unlock a piece of gear was incredibly satisfying. It was a really, really solid design of them. And by the end, you're going to have a major arsenal of weapons and spells to select from, which are going to allow you to... Um, you know, be whatever you want to be, which is cool because a lot of these games, especially those early platformer games, didn't really give you freedom of choice. And you kind of just picked the weapon because it did the most damage. But here there were so many trade-offs in terms of the abilities that performed, like the aforementioned weapon that turns enemies into stone. Definitely wasn't the strongest weapon in the game. But if you were in a room where there was a lot of enemies coming at you very quickly, 
turning half of them into stones so they couldn't attack you anymore might actually persuade you to use that weapon as opposed to something that's a little more traditional. And while it was one of the weaker weapons, the handgun was just really, really cool. And see little, little pixel art bullet casings flying out of your weapon as you're basically mowing down uh, demons and <laughs> vampires with a handgun was really neat. So they absolutely nailed the weapons and customization. The soundtrack was great. The graphics were definitely an improvement over the last one that were way too washed out and muted. And the biggest thing I can say is the level design in this game was incredibly more explanatory than the other two. That may come off to some people as to say easier. I never took it as easier. I did die quite a few times on some of the last bosses. I thought they were particularly challenging. They had multiple phases and different attack patterns. You had to really be on your toes, and I like that. But in terms of exploring the castle, I felt as if it was a little bit more clear where I needed to go and what I needed to do. Just like other Metroidvania games, you're gonna very quickly see some really cool weapon that's just out of reach that you can't get, and you're gonna come back to it 10, 15 hours later with a new ability that you have and unlock it, and it's gonna be amazing. Um, that still exists. There's always those items that are like, hey, you can't have it yet. You're going to have to get double jump. You don't know how to double jump yet. Too bad. And then the second you get double jump, you run you run straight back to that place because you're like, oh my God, let me get out of that weapon. And of course, it's an upgrade and you're happy. Um, there's a lot of that. But just in terms of like, where do you go? What's the next thing to do? The game does a good job of guiding you with all those NPCs that are constantly talking to you. You know what areas you're kind of supposed to be heading towards. And when you find an upgrade, it's very clear that there's like a teleporter nearby or a path you haven't explored nearby, which allow you to kind of keep the action flowing. Something that really frustrated me significantly with Harmony of Dissonance was how lost I kept getting, especially with the dual castle system, which was a cool concept, but very, very convoluted in terms of like, wait, where am I supposed to be and what am I actually exploring? Here it was very clear what I was supposed to do at any given time, and it let, allowed me to get in the action, find the next wave of enemies, unlock more tactical abilities, and continue the story. And that is, for a mobile game, if you're doing something that's like a quick hit, this is definitely that kind of experience, and I really appreciated it. Um, in conclusion with kind of my overall thoughts on the game, it was awesome. It was definitely the best of the three. If I had to rank them all, this was definitely the best. Circle of the Moon was second and Harmony of, Distant, Harmony of Dissonance was a distant, distant third. Um, this game just seemed to take everything they had learned from the other stuff, the other two games, with uh, great new abilities, lots of custom sprites, tons of enemies, fun level design, fun weapons and put them in the ultimate package. And in any kind of game where you can really customize your character in such a meaningful way uh, and really kind of own your build was just so rewarding. And it was fun to finish the game and to check out the forums from like 20 years ago, obviously, and read what people did and like, oh, I never thought of doing that ability or, oh, I didn't even think of using that ability there to get past this tough boss or to check this out or whatever. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of replayability. And then, as I mentioned, after you beat the game, you can play as Julius, which does not have any of those abilities. It's back to the traditional weapon set. So he's got, you can cycle through his traditional weapons. He's got uh, the traditional whip and there's no, it's just like a more basic tra uh, Castlevania game, which makes the gameplay significantly different the second time around because you don't have all these cool abilities and you almost like, oh wow, like the game is so much more enhanced for having those. So I think they did a really, really good job with this game and it was a pleasure to play through this experience. I hope that, you know, looking forward, I'd love to see Castlevania make a return. Um, and I would love to get into the PlayStation side-scrolling variants. They don't have a collection for these yet. My understanding is some of them are on the PlayStation Plus Essential service. So I may have a reason to finally check those out because after I finished this game, all I could think of is, what's next? And the answer was nothing. I had done it all. So at least up to now. So I'm current as of 2003 Castlevania. And with that, I'm gonna close out this video. Uh, I hope you guys found it interesting and fun. Like I said, I'll post links to the other videos I've done in the description below. If you're just jumping into this one, you wanna see my thoughts on the other two. This was an incredible ride. And I gotta say the Castlevania Advanced Collection was totally money well spent. I absolutely recommend it. and. 
I really feel like Aria Sorrow is a game I'll probably play again at some point in the future just for like that comfort food because it was so much fun. Thank you guys so much for watching. Take care of yourselves. And until next time, I will see you guys on the other side.